you can be as a table if you want. I can okay. make it work so here. Hmm. Do you guys want to sit and do your presentation sitting? Sure. Whatever makes you feel comfortable. So is this on? Hello. <laughs> okay. Um, can we take that off? <laughs> Okay, so um, I just want to thank Nan for inviting us here today to present on uh, Tikkunagan and our <clears throat> services. So I'm just going to start with a brief um, overview of um, how Tikkunagan became uh, present in Thunder Bay, I guess you can say. So back in uh, January 2020, Tikkunagan was designated by the ministry to provide child protection services to families from our communities. Um, prior to that, it was only Delico and uh, Thunder Bay CAS. Um, so <clears throat> that's about three years ago now. So we do have, um, sorry. So like the whole, why did you, so the, this presentation is just gonna go over all the services that Tick Noggin um, provides within our 30 First Nations, as well as some of the urban uh, places that we're in, like Thunder Bay, Sulaco, Kenora. Um, so I'm gonna let, cause we, we made a little plan about how we're gonna present. <laughs> I, I guess I should have introduced myself, I'm sorry. My name is Catherine Morris and I'm a service manager for Tikkunagan. I've been with Tikkunagan for almost nine years. Um, I'm from Gitchinamex at Beninawag, as well as uh, Fort Hope. Um, so I'm gonna get Donna Gagnon to start the presentation. And she's gonna go over about, go over with um, like, you know, the, the history of Tikkunagan and all that. Here. Does that mean anything? Yeah, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Donna Gagnon. Um, uh, I've been involved with Tikkunagan now for uh, 16 years. July will be my 16th year. I started off with a family service worker. I worked in a few communities in the north, uh, Martin Falls, Admatoon, Dishkandika, Webkoy, Aralan, and Martin Falls. So I look after those communities. Uh, there's been some changes since. Um, but then after I did one year of family services, traveling to the north quite a bit. And then my second year, I, I was involved with intake investigations for two years. So I traveled extensively throughout the north during that time. And then I became a, a, a supervisor for Aralan Martin Falls. So I was situated in Aralan. I'm based in Aralan. So I live there. Uh, I met my husband there. I've got uh, three grown children and eight grandchildren. So I worked out what the majority of the time was in Ireland and coming to Sulaco, traveling quite extensively. Uh, I had a lot of uh, reports like traveling the north, charters, La Bamba charters, you know, <laughs> you name it. I've been on everywhere. But yeah, 16 years is. Uh, now I'm a service manager. I was looking after six communities, but now uh, there's some changes within our organization to come. Uh, so I'd be look I'm still looking after Airland, uh, Martin Falls, and Greenstone, Geraldton. So that's gonna be my area. We're in the development of uh, starting Greenstone up because we always serviced in the North, right? Uh, we look after... Uh, uh, 30 communities, um, um, which is, uh, we've been here for like almost 40 years, let's say. We've been here for quite a while. Uh, we have been serving over 30 First Nations. Of course, uh, they're created by the leadership, right, of uh, our region. Tikkunagan is a community-based uh, child welfare agency rooted and accountable in the communities that we serve. So we all we service 30 communities all pretty well in the NAN territory as well. So uh, we are here to support and strengthen our children, our families and our communities. And in doing this, we believe the answers lie within the communities, right? So 
we have units in the communities. We have active uh, units, uh, lots of workers. Um, so we are governed by 30 corporate members, the chief of each First Nation. We serve and we report to and receive direction from. Uh, also, we are led, of course, by a board of directors appointed by the Chiefs Council, right? And also we are guided by an elders council, youth counselor, youth council who memberships drawn from the First Nations we serve. So they're all chosen by their communities, right? So, so managed by our people, members, senior management um, belong to one of our First Nation and most managers are from, from the First Nations. So like a lot of us are from the First Nation. Uh, we are community-based. We definitely have 27 units out of 30 First Nations. So we got a lot of staffing uh, in our communities. Of course, uh, there's always a turnover as well, right? Like we're all, they come, they go, we train, they go. But it's always coming. And uh, right now in Thunder Bay, we're definitely looking for a lot of workers. If you go into Tikkanagan's website, there's a lot of information there um, about jobs, uh, people looking for jobs in each area, right? So they're all there. Um, so we're definitely staffed by our people. We're, we make up 60% uh, of our staff are First Nation um, and definitely from the communities that we serve, right? So following the service model created by our, pe by our people, Mamo Obiki Waswin, I was practicing it before, and I says, when the presentation comes, watch me not say it properly. <laughs> So it means Mamo Ubiki Wasawan, everyone working together to raise our children. So that's our vision. That's what it means that everybody comes together collectively, especially when it comes to decision of our children, right? So Mamo is rooted in the culture of our communities and reflects our traditional practices and values. So we're more streamed to the values of our children and our communities. Eh? So Definitely, this is our, our vast area here. We have serving 30 First Nations from Airland, Bearskin Lake, Cat Lake, Deer Lake, Admontoon, First Port Severin, uh, Kuchiching, Casabonica Lake, Kiwewan, uh, Kingfisher, Kichu, sorry if I can pronounce that right, but Lac Sioux, McDowell Lake, Martin Falls, Meshkugaming, Mich a lot of name changes from the the names right so Muskrat Dam, Shkandiga, Slate Falls, Nibinimik, North Caribou Lake, North Spirit, Pecanchicum, Popular, Sajgo, Sandy Lake, Saugeen, Wapakika, uh, Wapakika, Wind, Webequa, and Wanaman. Yes, we've got a vast <laughs> of communities that we do serve as Tikkanagan and now coming to uh, Thunder Bay, right, the mainstream. So we definitely have a lot of uh, work ahead of us. And uh, so, yeah, this is where we are. Uh, we're serving these connected to our 31st Nations living in the urban areas. Now that we're servicing Thunder Bay District, Sulaco, Kenora, Red Lake, Dryden, Geraldton, Emo, Pickle Lake, Atticoke, and Fort Francis, Rainy River. So that's the expansions. That's our goal that we're working towards. And uh, we definitely have lots of, lots of work to do. And uh, Lots of uh, workers we're looking for. <laughs> okay, just to uh, go back um, when she was listing some of the communities. Um, recently, Gitchin Megsip and Inawag has uh, gone live with their family law. As of April 1st, they now have a, a family law in place within their community that allows them to have uh, their own child and family services. And it's called... Um, which means, you know, KI, Big Trout Family Law. So that was a long partnership with uh, between Tikkanagan and the community where they worked on this law and um, developed a program for the community where they can oversee uh, services for all their uh, First Nation members in the community as well as... Um, in other places. So it kind of co uh, aligns with the new uh, Bill C-92 that came into effect also, I think in 
2020. I'm pretty sure. So that's with like the band representatives that we were seeing all the programs that are coming out. Um, you know, where, where it says that uh, Indigenous communities and chief and council, they have inherent right and authority over their families, no matter where they are. And um, when I talked about designation for, for Tikkanagan here in the city of Thunder Bay, um, there was, um, you know, a little bit of back and forth with the agency here in the city that was already here and Tikkanagan. And um, it was something that our chiefs wanted. They wanted us to provide services to our families in the city of Thunder Bay and the district. So we did, and, and we were awarded that designation by the ministry. So, and uh, that's our hope, I think. I just wanna to touch on that also. Um, like our position as an agency is that we will support any of our First Nations, our chiefs and, and uh, the development of their own laws. Um, that's what we see. Moving forward, we want to see our own communities self-govern and, and uh, take care of their own families the way they want to, the way they need to. Um, you know, I understand there's a lot of talk about, you know, uh, child welfare, you know, all over Canada, right? And um, Tick and Agon, I, I must say, we're, we're ahead of the game in a lot of ways. We've been practicing customary care for many years. We've developed our service model, Mamo Biggie House, when, um, years ago, which uh, looks to the community for support. So within every service that Tikkanagan offers, um, consultation with the First Nation is key. It's always the first point of contact when we're dealing with a family. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about the services that we provide. We've grown a lot in the last few years. Um, and then it's in a good way. It's not because, you know, we're <laughs> taking over everywhere, but we're developing a lot of programs that are necessary, right? Um, so the first, I guess the first point of contact with Tikkanagan usually comes as a, a child protection concern, because that's what we are. We're, we're a child protection agency. And, um, so, you know, we'd receive a referral, um, it would be processed and a response will be determined, um, you know, could lead to an investigation, maybe not. Um, so if there's a need for ongoing services, so, you know, a family's struggling or whatever and with uh, something and, and we feel the need that uh, this this family requires more support, we'll move it, on, we'll move it to ongoing family services. And uh, they'll be assigned a worker um, to help them, you know, develop a service plan. Uh, we really look to the First Nation to see, to, to locate more supports for the family, depending on where they are, you know, like we, we always look for extended family. We look for other service providers, ONWA, you know, Friendship Center, something like anything like that, that can support them. Um, one of our really big, um, services that are really we're really utilizing now and this is our approach that we take at intake um, is all is the prevention services <clears throat> so we're really trying to shift because you know sadly historically indigenous people like you know a lot of us come from poverty and uh, myself included I, I grew up poor you know like we struggled <laughs> and um, and uh, you see like families here out in the city, you see people up north, you know, like everything's expensive. And it was a practice to go in and look at people's cupboards, you know, like that was just a normal practice that people adopted. And, and Tikkanagan, you know, we're, we're not in agreement to that. We don't, we don't like that. That's so intrusive, intrusive. That's like oppressive. It's, it's so many things, right? It's, it's just not right. So we were so glad that as an agency, we were able to move forward in providing prevention, you know? I don't need to look in anybody's cupboard to know that they're struggling, you know? Like you, you just you just know. And, so, and the way you need to help is ask and say, you know, do you need anything? Like, is there anything, this is what we can do for you, you know? And uh, through prevention services, we're able to mitigate protection concerns. Like I've, I've had, I've had, uh, you know, people concerned about children's uh, sleeping 
areas or bedding and, you know, not being safe, safe sleep. It's a big thing. Um, or just not having enough food, you know, and I think we can all relate to the cost of groceries. So, you know, I always urge our staff, you know, ask these people, what can we do to help you? Prevention is such a big term. It could be used so wide, widely, like it could be like at an investigation, mitigating protection concerns there through groceries or safe sleep. But it can also be events within the community, you know, where community comes together, where children are able to uh, learn, you know, do land-based stuff, anything like that. So prevention is big. We love it. We're glad we're able to use it. <laughs> um, we also have child care services. So this is for children who are in care of Tikkanagan. And um, they're assigned a child care worker to ensure, you know, all their needs are being met. Um, our child care workers, you know, ensure the, the education piece for the kids are done, you know, all assessments, like say we have young babies coming in who possibly been exposed to alcohol in, in utero, right? And, and if we have that information and we know a child's gonna be in care, we will do referral to like uh, FASD assessments and stuff, right? So the childcare services, they do a lot. They do tons of work. It's basically raising, uh, you know, helping raise a bunch of little people. <laughs> I, um, I, uh, <clears throat> I really commend them for all their work that they do because they travel you know, we, we have high risk kids who run off and we all work together to locate them or, you know, it's just, it's a tough job because you have a lot of responsibility. You also have the responsibility of, of ensuring like relationships and connections to the community, the family, like getting these visits happening and everything that's, that's important, right? Because we want to keep our children connected to their family, no matter what, you know, even if parents aren't doing good. We work with our child care services and our family services and our foster care services to ensure that, you know, planned visits and, you know, connection remains open. Um, I'm going to just kind of touch on Negan and Abin quickly, because we have a piece at the end of this uh, presentation. So it's a, a new program that we've developed at Tikkanagan and it's called Negan and Abin and it means looking forward and it's uh, directed at um, our youth transitioning from care so that's from like 18 is it 18 or 21 18 <laughs> to 26 sorry um, so this is like ensuring that they have good transitional supports so um, I think it's pretty safe to say that you know, CAS in Canada was not transitioning youth properly and safely. Um, you know, there was a lack of resources, a lack of programs developed aimed at young people who are coming out of care, who are leaving care. And um, it's a tough world out there. You know, like I think I can speak, I can speak personally about, you know, like being a young person and and how difficult it could be to navigate the systems out there, right? And um, could be even more harder as a young person who's vulnerable, who has deficits and all that. So Negan and Nabin was um, developed to address like, uh, you know, those things for youth coming out of care. Um, it was also um, <clears throat> attached to the post-majority um, program that the ministry, I think they, the ministry, uh, directive came out in, I want to say May of last year. So uh, I need to know more about it. <laughs> I'm not that, <laughs> I'm not an expert on Negan and Abin yet. <laughs> but anyways, um, just to move on here to uh, our foster care and agency operated homes. So we do have foster homes throughout the North. <laughs> Also, Sioux Lookout, like in all, every area that we serve and have offices, we, we try to have foster homes. 
Um, we have a lot of Indigenous foster homes. We're always looking for more foster parents, always. <laughs> and um, we have agency operated homes. So some of these um, homes are modeled as a staff model or a live-in model, um, right? <laughs> and um, sometimes it's, uh, kids end up in these uh, homes under like emergency or it's just their placement until we can find something for them. Um, we have a whole unit um, that works on residential care stuff. So like anything with the foster homes, like foster parents and getting them assessed and everything, ensuring that we're up to date on our licensing. You know, we have, we still, we still um, work with the ministry and we get reviewed. Is it annually? I'm asking these guys because they should know. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so we're in, I think we're in the development of our agency operated group homes right now. We do have, um, we've been able to finally purchase capital and and uh, to develop our own foster homes because previously, when I started back in like 2015 or whatever, um, and then I became a manager, I think 2017, and uh, I started to see the need for, for kids to have like a treatment group home type setting, right? They're, kids need it. A lot of our kids struggle. And, uh, but we were having to send them out of jurisdiction, which we call uh, out of jurisdiction, I don't know, what are, oh, yeah, OPRs. Oh, I don't even wanna go into that, but <laughs> it's unfortunate because we didn't have the resources within our own territory region to provide these services to young people. So I'm very happy to say, you know, we've, we've been able to, to get um, buildings, land and whatever to develop some group homes that we can work with our young people instead of sending them far. Um, so we're taking Agins like a, a 24 hour service, 365 days a year, we're available. Uh, you can reach us through our 1-800 number and um, you will come into contact with our after hours team. So our after hours team consists of an on-duty manager, a supervisor, and you have like case aides and after hours family service workers to respond to any concerns or anything. Um, so we have um, a few different areas that, like every, every community has an after hours worker to respond. So if you ever have a concern or anything like that, you can always call any time of day Somebody will take your call, your information, and somebody will, you know, address whatever concern you have. Um, and then the last two things are more directed at youth in care. So we have a youth outreach program. And um, I don't like using the term high risk youth, but, <laughs> so, you know, we have challenging young people within our care. And um, I mean, as a challenging, challenged youth myself, but you know, like I had my mom to chase after me and whatnot. Um, but so we we developed this program so that we can support young people. You know, we have a lot of young people here in the city who become involved with you know pretty scary situations. Like times have changed here in Thunder Bay. Everywhere, I'd say, you know, we're dealing with a lot of drug use and like human trafficking, stuff like that. So um, this is really developed to, to ensure that we know who's around, like which kids need more support. It's almost like that circle of care. How can we wrap around services so that everybody within Tikkanagan that can support this young person is aware? Say for instance, um, have a young person that comes from Sioux Lookout to Thunder Bay to attend school. And we know that this young person, you know, likes to go AWOL, you know, you know, takes off and gets into some alcohol, you know, the, the unit would make that, make us aware of that, right? And then we'd be like, okay, so so-and-so is here for school. How can we ensure their safety? So a lot of times we develop uh, high-risk youth safety plans. 
so we 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 try to approach it in a way where this young person is also accountable to their own safety and um you know they're going to agree with us going to they're in agreement with us to to you know try to keep their heads straight <laughs> doesn't always work out it's good in real re, you know the way you think about it but um sometimes when it comes to like the youth outreach piece um it's just a matter of um ensuring that uh everybody knows what's going on um this can also be like for young people who are still in care, like under 18 and, and they need help with like doing a resume, you know, going to the laundromat, like basic life skills and development, because sometimes our childcare workers are very like, you know, busy because they have multiple files or what, whatever. But uh, I've seen this work very well. You know, we've, we've tied, we've uh, paired up a young youth outreach worker with um you know a young a young man who is you know having some complicated things happen and uh they would go like they'd go for a walk they'd go to a movie or something so it was actually a really good it's actually a really good program works for some not everybody but um i think the whole like approach is to keep kids safe and make sure that they feel supported and then we have clinical counseling we have a clinical counseling unit within our agency, but it's only for kids in care. So we have, I think about four clinical counselors now. So they travel around, they see kids. Um, I think it's more like a, a stabilization approach. And then, you know, you, you kind of um, get these kids stable and then we out, you know, uh, refer them to other resources for like, you know, more care if needed. So this is the 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 word that no one can say. <laughs> Mamo big house win. Uh, everybody working together to raise our children. So, um, like I mentioned before, um, very important to us to include the First Nation, uh, extended family, education. You know, like that whole um, circle of care. Mm. Yeah, 35 plus years of work. <laughs> Lots of work. Um, did I just, sorry. So I, th I spoke about that with like the whole Bill C-92 and the uh, development of uh, KI law and just the way Tikkanagan um, provides services is through um, Mamo Big House and, you know, we look to the community for answers, the First Nation. And yeah, that, that's our ultimate goal right there. And I, and I did mention that previously, um, you know, we'd like to see our, all our First Nations that we serve um, develop their own law and, and provide services to their families the way they see, you know, fit. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is the circle of care that I spoke about. Um, this is how we, we do our work and um, we do, we do a consultation with the First Nation um, elders, parents, and the child's always at the center of everything. Um, yeah, just a little visual for everybody. <laughs> This is, um, the, yeah, it was like, what? these are the values for Mamo Big House one. I'm not gonna read them all. <laughs> so this is um, it's called, uh, so when we're making decisions, like say for, for instance, well, most decisions have to be, you know, through our First Nations and, um, or their band representatives. So many communities have developed their own band rep, band program. Um, so a lot of them are active. Some haven't started, some are beginning to start and uh, everything's different. It's a, it's a changing time with Tikkanagan because like I said, we take a lot of our direction from the First Nation 
we're dually mandated, right? We're still mandated through the province and legislation and all that, but we're also mandated by all our chiefs. So we listen to our chiefs, you know, like we listen to our communities and um, all the decisions we, we go, we always have like a band rep person or a, a counselor that holds the portfolio. And um, we have case conferences, like that's what our work is all about. We're case conferencing all day long. Uh, you know, we, we're in meetings, we pull everybody together as quick, pretty quickly in <laughs> some days. So like, if we have an urgent matter, we always have a case conference. We work with the First Nation and, um, and they're made by using the Deben Chigewin so it's basically like a talking circle. I'm, I'm going to try to translate it like sitting in a circle talking, right? That's what that means. That's how I translate it in my head. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's just this is just the normal way of how we conduct our work at Tikkanagan. And um it it's uh I think it's the best way. You have the family who has a voice, everybody's equal, right? Everybody has their opportunity to talk and and we try to keep it uh respectful and all that. Um it's a difficult thing to to have to deal with child welfare, and we understand that. And and we're trying to be as respectful and kind and compassionate to, you know, the families that we work with. So these are all the people that we like to have involved. It might not be every conference, but these are, you know, people who play a role in, in uh, ensuring children's well-being within the community or, you know, Thunder Bay, wherever they're at. Um, And we have a lot of new, like, a lot of new services out there that I think are great. Like, we got Nan Hope, we got Mitawa, looking after their kids out here, the, you know, their safe sobering site, like, <laughs> that didn't exist when I was a kid, you know, you went straight to Belmarle. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah, the, what else is there? We also have like, um, like within the community, they're starting to develop their own like family well-being, um, like camps and stuff, like a lot of land-based stuff. I know Mish has one. They have like a treatment, family treatment. Weagmao has one. Summer Beaver has one where they take the kids out. I know KI just finished building all their, um, all their cabins for Choose Life. Yeah. Choose life is great. Like, we're so thankful for Choose Life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um. Again, with the, with the circle of care, right? Um. We have them so frequently these case conferences because we're cons things are constantly changing. You're dealing with people, right? You're dealing with lives, real lives, and we're constantly meeting, having conferences, sharing information, trying to get information, making plans. And you know what? Plans blow up all the time. Like they blow up. You you walk away and you're like, oh, that's a great plan. You turn around and it's like, oof, you know, like oh, we're back to square one. So. Um, my first director used to always say, oh, that's a great plan, Catherine. Now give me plan B and C. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So that's my, that's my, you know, that's how I conduct my work now, because I know just because you want it to happen, doesn't mean it's going to happen, especially when dealing with, with, uh, teenagers, <laughs> you know, and weather, like, I don't know how many times I've been stuck somewhere up north. <laughs> no place better to be stuck, though. You're always taken care of when you go up north. Um, so these are just uh, the components of Mamo Big House. When, um, and I'll go into a little bit of detail about which 
how, how they work. So the first one is uh, First Nations Mammal Big House de Declaration. So these agreements, this, this declaration could be used for when, um, to keep kids out of care. So say, say for instance, we're working with a family and um, they say, I wanna place my child here. So the First Nation can say, okay, we're in agreement with that while the family works on whatever they need to, or we need to mitigate concerns and deal with whatever. Kids can go to auntie and uncle. The First Nation will say, we'll sign that document and say, declaring that home a safe home. And we're like, great, that's the best way. <laughs> Our second agreement is uh, when children, you know, sometimes need to leave the home. Um, we use these a lot when um, to keep kids out of care, but to also keep kids with family. And right now, um, we've been able to provide more financial assistance with these with these agreements, where kids can say, for instance, go be with an uncle and aunt, and um, they could be placed there. And we'll we'll continue to provide service to the mom and dad and and also the individual, the caregiver for, for the supervision agreement. Um, the peer customary care, that's not something we really use, right? Not anymore, yeah. I'm not even very familiar with it, to be quite honest. Um, something that our, our main like legal status document is the Tick and Mamo a big house when care agreement. So we, so when we have to bring a child into care, um, this is the document that we use where the family signs it. And um, it could be for a duration of six months or 12 months. Um, it also could be long-term till they turn 18. It's a document that the First Nation signs and agrees to and says, yep, yeah. This child's in care of Tikkanagan, they have legal status. So instead of Tikkanagan going to court and filing an application for apprehension for a child, that's our document. However, <laughs> here in Thunder Bay, we're, we're having a bit of a complications with using our care agreements. But I don't wanna go into that right now. <laughs> I don't know everything about it yet, and I don't want to <laughs> misinform anybody. Uh, I do believe that there was some kind of um, thing passed within the courts that has to do with customary care. Um, and then we have the Nepage Me Now Wasuin Custom Adoption. This is not something that Tikkanagan um, is the driver for, um, it's a document that we have that supports uh, the First Nation and the family if they do decide, say for instance, a mom has a baby and she wants to gift her child to her cousin. This is not something new to us. This is a common practice within our families, my family especially, and all my cousins, like, you know, they, they've raised, they've raised uh, nieces and all that. And, and so this is a document that Tikkanagan has that, uh, that supports that, but it has to be driven by the First Nation and the family. It's not us. <laughs> we just, we're, we're party to it, but uh, yeah. So it's most like a, like a gifting, traditional gifting of a child, you know, and uh, it's not something we go out there and try to push. Like that's not our, that's not the position we take on that. This was, I, <laughs> just a little diagram and it's a little technical I think <laughs> um just shows the differences between um Tikkanagan like our, our our service model and the mainstream child protection say for instance uh Thunder Bay CAS um I'm not gonna go through it all because it wasn't even supposed to be in here <laughs> <laughs> this was like uh yeah it's a little more technical but I I mean if you probably can just look at it and and see that there are some big differences especially when I talked about um the court 
piece, right? Um, Tikkanagan loves that we don't have to go to court, but we're seeing that we have to more and more, which not great, but it is a common factor when you're in a more urban area and you're dealing with other, you know, court court houses that are not, you know, probably not understanding of customary care and First Nations and all that. <laughs> you want to? Do you want to talk about Negan and Evan? So this is just, I mentioned it before, and Nora's going to share a little bit. It's not too much. Yeah. It's, uh... Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nora Vincent. Um, I've been with the agency, um, well, 17 years, then I left for two years to be a band counselor for Laksu, and I returned. Um, and now I'm a service manager for the residential care. Um, yeah, so I'll start with uh, Nigan. Same thing. Nigan and Aben, which means looking forward in the object Cree, provides cultural appropriate host. Holistic service supporting youth aging out of care and youth uh, adults form, formerly in care up to age 26 from Tikkanagan's 30 First Nations. Um, who can access it? Uh, Nigana Anabin program supports youth currently or formerly in the care of Tikkanagan Child Fund Services. Uh, planning begins as early as your age 17 birthday and serves, service are available throughout your transition into young adulthood up to 26 birthday. And, um, the <clears throat> Nigan and Mabin program is volunteer and does not require any legal status or commitment. Okay. Um, what we offer Nigan and Mabin provides you with culturally appropriate autistic services to support your transition into early childhood. We will help you navigate resources you need to succeed by connecting you with existing supports within your communities. We provide safety, security, and stability to develop necessary life skills for you to achieve independence and build your future. Our program is easy to access and priorities prioritize your self-identified best interest. The sports are comfortable housing, financial, connecting to land, cultural, and spiritual, learning and education, willingness. That's, I can't even read that. Parents are to always remember and practice our traditional parenting responsibility, raising the children and teaching our children. So. And that's our um, website for me, Dan and Evan. To learn more. Yeah, um, I'm not really sure. Um, I know they're, they're, um, working on um, our youths that are like 17, between the 17 and 26 years old to try and help them get um, housing and like just financially and so that they're not left out on the street, like just taking them off, out of care and then putting them on a the street where they don't know. 
So we're here to try and support them learning and the education and stuff. So okay. <laughs> questions? Sure. Yeah. Did she outreach youth worker? What what does what does she do or he do? Um, it all depends. Um, it's for kids that are impaired, like kids that are impaired with learning. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, like the the assigned workers would have to identify needing that outreach support. Yeah. And they can do a number of things. They can support the young person with um like. Going, going to the movies, like they can help them maybe help them apply for a job, you know, help them cook their meals, right. anything like that. Yeah, because yeah, because the reason why I'm asking is, you know, um, ever since I became a counselor, I've always had uh, child welfare, <clears throat> and uh, you know, uh, I see kids that are aging out. And I know there is, they're trying to help them uh, with their, um, uh, what they need to move forward with their lives. But what I see is, uh, I think that these, these children or teenagers, or whatever, the ones that are aging out, they need lots of support, lots. Because they're really lost. They're, they grew up in a system. They don't know their family or community. And I know some of them end up in streets. And a lot of them uh, are not, uh, I think they're, they're, uh, they're they, they fall through the crack. Because, you know, I, uh, I've been talking about this girl back home. She she was in care all her life. For the past two years, she's been home, but she's homeless because of her high high needs or high behavior. And yet, still today, she she does have home for a while. She just goes there and comes right back out. And that's what I mean. They need a lot of help. They need a lot of. Uh, to get to know their family and their community. And, uh, and, and that's why I'm saying, I think those outreach workers has to do more than just finding homes for, for these kids. And I know we have some here in Thunder Bay that, uh, that do have their own apartments, um, but it's not, some of them are not stable because of the, what happened in their lives. I think they need to be really uh, to focus on them. Uh, even in back home, I've been asking if they could build houses for those kids like this girl I'm talking about. And there are going to be other kids that are be that will be like that, aging out, and they don't know their community or family. They try to fit in the community when they finally come home, but it's not the same. And I and I think they. They need to be really uh, to focus on these because we're going to lose them if, if if we don't do anything about them. Because I'm talking about this girl, you know, how how uh, how much poor priority is her to get a house because of uh, what's what's happening in her life. And when you try to talk to her, she's all over the place because she's not stable. And I think we really need to focus on those uh, aging out, aging out the ones that was in in care for all their lives. I know in our community now we see that what mistake we did to those kids. Now we're trying to not to. Uh, we're along the kids in care anymore. We try to, our best to work with the families, but it's so hard and it's so challenging because of the alcohol and drugs flow in our communities. 
And I always worry about the kids that are born with drugs and alcohol. What kind of kind of uh, chaos are we going to be dealing with because of lack of services in our communities? I think there needs to be more education on uh, how to parent with uh, the kids that uh, are born into drugs and alcohol. So what we see sometimes is when a parent can't uh, handle their children, of course, they're going to give them up to Tignagan because there's services there. Eh? And, uh, and and I see that in our community, uh, even here in Thunder Bay, when you have case conferences, we, we deal a lot of those kind of situations. I mean, Um, yeah, you, you make a great point, and I think that's why um, we're now moving to developing these programs for young people. And you make a lot of great points, right? We're dealing with um, a lot of drugs and alcohol within our communities, within the city of Thunder Bay, Sulacote, and everything, right? Um, and we have, like, hardly any resources for treatment, right? And if you and if we do, it's it's <laughs> the wait list is very long. Um, and another thing, like that, nobody really mentions is that parents that we're dealing with are also FAS, right? They have deficits. They're coping with alcohol, and then we're seeing more and more children being uh, born into, you know, uh, FASD and. And um, I know this because we have a lot of young kids who need assessments and um, kids that are growing up in care, um, you know, we're trying to get them assessed or trying to, especially the ones that are aging out, like when we're, we look at, we look at transitional youth as age 15 is when we try to identify them because these kids are usually the ones you know, in long-term care. So we're trying to identify them early and link them to services. Um, it's very challenging and it takes a lot of people, a lot of referrals, assessments um, to, to transition one young person in the past that I've worked with has taken years and Tikkanagan has... Uh, assumed responsibility for the young man until we were able to really get him over to adult services. So the young lady that you speak about is, is somebody who should have been linked with adult services. And a lot of times this is like options in Thunder Bay, that's options, our community living in, in Sulacote and Dryden. Um, they're really great. We work great with them, but sometimes it's a, uh, it's just a lack of of resources, I think, for for all of us up north in terms of anything. <laughs> so I think it, it's really based on communities, you know, really trying to help their families too and, and get that addiction services up there because, you know, it, it's children come into care all the time. Um, but as large as we are, like Tikkanagan, we don't have... Uh, like a lot of kids in care like I don't think we have um, considering how large we are we definitely don't uh, have the same amount as any small agency in Manitoba so but yeah definitely need to assist and support kids and and thankfully we have Negan and Abin and that's how we are trying to ensure kids are transitioning to adulthood, I guess, safely. And um, when you talk about like the housing, housing stuff, like I think it just across all communities, housing is such uh, in dire need, right? Like we don't, it's the overcrowding, the lack of safe houses up North is just uh an issue all on its own and it affects everybody, especially young people who don't have children or who are suffering from mental health. 
um, that goes to that goes the same thing here in Thunder Bay. Like it's so hard to get housing. And if you're in housing, you're part of Thunder Bay housing, which puts you in these uh, like buildings that are, you know, just kind of not the safest, most healthy, healthy places, right? So, or nobody wants to rent to you out here. <laughs> so, but uh, thank you for your comment. And if you have any other questions, let us know. But um, okay, so I just like to thank Tikkanagan for taking the time to be here at the Continuity of Care Forum. Um, I just have a little gift here. And thank you to everyone in the room and everyone online. Um, I believe we're going to take a break now before we head downstairs for the final presentation of the day. Miigwech.